Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Welcome to the U.S. Energy Information Administration's second workshop that will explore trends and expectations surrounding the outlook for energy markets. Today, we will discuss petroleum and natural gas markets. We're very excited to have several distinguished panelists joining us. Thank you to them for agreeing to be here and sharing their thoughts and insights. These workshops are very important to us, and we are joined today by both Administrator Linda Capano and Deputy Administrator Steve Nally. My name is John Staub, and I lead EIA's Petroleum and Natural Gas Analysis. EIA is a statistical agency within the U.S. Department of Energy. Our mission is to provide independent and impartial data and analysis that can be used to better understand how energy markets function and make informed decisions. I want to review a few housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar. A link to both the recording and presentations will be sent to all participants once it has been uploaded to EIA's website with closed captioning. To avoid background noise, all attendees have been placed on mute. There will be a Q&A period for each session. You may submit your questions at any time using the chat function in the WebEx control panel. Please be sure to direct your questions to all panelists. We will do our best to follow up with you on any questions we do not get to today. I want to thank Kelsey Brazier and Mindy farber Dianda of EIA for helping monitor and run the WebEx and Q&A here today. This has been an unusual and extraordinary year with an extreme petroleum demand shock in the second quarter and an involving supply response with limited information. At EIA, we, like many others, are developing new approaches to gather information and estimate the direction and the scale of market changes. These workshops are one way for us to better understand the dynamics we are observing. Our workshop today has two sessions. The first session focuses on identifying signposts for rebalancing oil and gas markets, and the second session covers supply competition in the markets. In our first session, we are fortunate to have two distinguished guests, speakers John Kemp, a Reuters market analyst specializing in energy systems and oil markets. Before joining Reuters in 2008, he worked as an analyst for the commodity trading arm of Sempra Energy and as a macroeconomic analyst at Oxford Analytica. The second speaker is Kevin Book, who heads research at Clearview Energy Partners, LLC in Washington, DC, where he also covers policy, economic trends, and fossil energy. Kevin is a member of the National Petroleum Council and the Council on Foreign Relations and affiliated with the energy program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're thrilled to hear their thoughts. With that, I'd like to pass the discussion over to John. Hello, everyone, and thank you to John for a generous introduction and inviting me to participate in this workshop today. The IA produces the world's best known and most authoritative statistics and analysis on energy markets, so it's a great honor to be asked to take part with you. Before we start looking at the detailed questions, I think it might be useful to set the scene with some basic data on where the oil market is right now. The industry has emerged from the largest and most sudden shock in its entire history following the pandemic and lockdowns earlier this year. The focus now is on how the market is rebalancing after the shocks, as well as longer term questions about whether the shock marks a temporary deviation or a structural shift in consumption production trends. We talk a lot about rebalancing, but what do we actually mean by the term? I think there are at least five interrelated elements. A closer balance between supply and demand, a normalization of crude and product stocks, a shift in the forward price curve towards a more normal long-term position, a sustainable flat price, and a, a, a flat price that provides sustainable investment within the industry. We can use each of these five as benchmarks or mileposts along the road to rebalancing. Over the course of the last six months, the market has shifted from a huge production surplus in March and April to a deficit from June onwards. So we are seeing some rebalancing um, on, the first of those, on the first of those five benchmarks. Inventories remain high, especially for crude and middle distillates, but they do show signs of drawing down, especially for crude and gasoline. On the forward curve, the curve has moved from a very wide contango in March and April to a much narrower one, though the narrowing has stalled and partially reversed since late June. The six-month Brent future spread, which is the one that I tend to follow, 
has currently settled in around the 21st percentile of all trading days since 1990. The continuing softness indicates that traders expect a relatively slow drawdown in the remaining stocks and that petroleum supplies will remain ample well into 2021. The rebalancing process should therefore be accompanied by a further drawdown in inventories and a further tightening of the spreads towards level and then backwardation over the remainder of this year and into next year. On the flat price side, front month futures prices have doubled since April, but like spreads, the upward trend has stalled over the summer and reversed somewhat. In real terms, the inflation adjusted Brent spot price is currently in the 43rd percentile of for all months since 1990. But that period includes a long period of low prices in the 1990s, so it perhaps overstates uh, or perhaps understates the long term um, equilibrium price within the market. If we focus just on the period since 2000, which is perhaps a bit more relevant, the real spot price has currently settled around the 18th percentile, so it remains very low. The median price for the entire period since 1990 is about $51. Um, although because it inc includes that long period of very low prices in the 1990s, that may be understating um, the cross-cycle average price. The median price since 2000 is about $2,000, but that may be unsustainably high um, given that the period includes the first and second shale booms, which saw US production capture essentially all the increase in global oil consumption at the expense of rival producers. Therefore, I would argue the market is most likely to rebalance with prices somewhere in the region between $50 and $70 per barrel. And I've argued elsewhere that the through cycle average price over the next cycle is likely to be at $60 or slightly below as Russia and Saudi Arabia try to prevent a further erosion of their market share. The final element of rebalancing is moving to a price that will encourage and finance sustainable investment within the industry. The unsustainable shale drilling and production booms of 2011 through 2014, and then the second boom from 2017 and 2018, have been replaced by a deep slump uh, following the price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia earlier this year, and of course the pandemic driven lockdowns. The number of rigs drilling for oil and gas in the United States has fallen by over 70% over the last 12 months uh, to multi decade lows. Higher prices and more rigs will clearly be needed to stabilize output. But in recent weeks, there are some signs that the rise in oil and gas prices since April has started to stabilize the rig count. Rigs have risen slightly since mid-August, which tentatively appears to have been the cyclical low. If prices stabilize around the current level, and especially if they move a little higher towards $50 a barrel, drilling should continue to accelerate which will in turn stabilize production in the later part of 2021. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Kevin Book. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to await uh, control of the slides and uh, take over once I, I have it. I have it. All right. Assuming I. Okay, uh, thank you again, both, uh, both of you, John and John, uh, for a wonderful lead in. It's great to be here. Uh, my very first slide uh, says, don't listen to me. It's a disclaimer slide, uh, but hopefully you will listen at least a little. Uh, we've been taking to calling this an asterisk here for all the reasons both John's mentioned. Uh, the asterisk, if you look at old statistics books, as some of us have, uh, often accompanies a, an entry that's either been omitted or limited by extenuating circumstances. Uh, much could be said about uh, supply, and I think there will be a lot of discussion about that in the, this panel and the next, but demand is, is in many ways, I think, the biggest mystery because of the substantial demand shock. And we wonder, is it different, and how do you know? And you can talk about total demand, in which case electrons in place of the molecules that commuted can offset some of the contraction. Uh, there's enhanced unemployment, which in, in, in places like the U.S., where governments are putting money into pockets, you have disposable personal income rising. And of course, light duty consumption in the US being such a big part of global liquids, uh, much of what I will say will focus locally. The, uh, the uncertainties, of course, are, are myriad. 
uh, institutional and individual risk perceptions among them, uh, vaccines and what they will do for us in the end, uh, and the degree to which communities, states, uh, and, and local governments uh, can recover and sustain demand in their own right. Uh, in terms of the, the questions, if you think about what it means to go to a conference without air travel, if you think about what it means to commute by walking steps down a hallway, you're using less energy, but if you're driving because you don't want to take public transit, maybe using more. And so when you get down to the question of what it means when you get to work, a more automated workplace could also be additive, uh, mechanized uh, demand uh, for energy, uh, automating processes that used to be uh, done by people. Uh, so a lot of balances to work out. When we talk about balancing the oil market, uh, OPEC has, has given us, OPEC plus, has given us a metric to work with, which is the, the deviation from the, the five-year uh, inventory trend. Uh, a couple of thoughts here. First, you can see, as John mentioned, there's been a stark draw in, in OECD inventories, uh, and the OPEC cut uh, is obviously a big part of, of why. But uh, this metric comes with a, a necessary explanation, which is that a moving average moves, and so if you have uh, a number, as you see it here, coming down from a peak looks, looks as it's sort of bullish, but it actually rolls into high inventories in the, in the five years that came into the previous window. So we're actually at a at record inventory levels, even though declining. Uh, still, this is a metric that uh, we often talk about for rebalancing. Another one that uh, comes up a lot is the upstream CapEx. Uh, my colleague Jacques Rousseau uh, has derived that about the, uh, 70, uh, 0.7 R squared uh, between uh, upstream uh, investment and same-year supply. So uh, the rebalancing happens when the cash comes, comes off. It takes money going into the ground to get oil out. Uh, when the money stops, the oil eventually does too, and that too brings us rebalancing. But so much of what we're talking about in demand is really two holes. No offense to trains, it's planes and automobiles we talk about. So revenue passenger kilometers, uh, so much of the, the overseas travel uh, makes up jet fuel demand. And if you look forward, the forward projections from the IATA, taking uh, those projections and then applying them to historical relationships between RPKs and, and, uh, and the, the jet fuel demand, the IEA uh, presented, you, you end up with a, a reasonable expectation of recovery, but not completely uh, in the next six calendar quarters. We'll be updating this, this soon with new IATA data. But the point is that we're not getting all the jet back and maybe we're not getting as much of it as even this uh, with RPKs down as much as they are. And then uh, there's the question of cars. Uh, disposable income share and the price responsiveness of the US driver uh, is a thing. Uh, it didn't used to be a thing. We were more inelastic, but we've seen more price responsiveness in driving behaviors. Not this year, though. You have a price falling to 1% of disposable personal income and year-on-year uh, -year product supply, using your very good numbers, thank you so much, uh, is down uh, at the same time because when you're locked up, you can't unlock demand. So this brings up a question, which is whether or not there's an organic proxy that one can use to try to understand something other than the action of governments locking down demand. Is there, is there an illness component that corresponds with DMT contraction? On the x-axis you have, uh, using the Federal Highway Administration, you're looking at the decline month versus year ago in uh, state-level DMT. And the bubbles represent the individual states, the bubble size, the share of road fuels consumption, so diesel and gasoline. The vertical axis is the monthly incremental cases uh, as a share of state population, uh, higher means sicker, and further to the right uh, on, on the x-axis uh, means driving less. And you can see in March a cluster about the x-axis uh, with a contraction, but not much sickness. Uh, when you get to April, you can see that uh, there's more sort of disparate sickness uh, and much more demand contraction. This was, of course, the peak of the lockdowns. By May, we're centered back at a slightly higher sickness level and uh, distributed around the contraction between March and April. Uh, and in June, you're starting to see the reopening taking hold. Uh, much more driving, that's what it means to get back towards the y-axis, uh, but also uh, growing illness. And our data series, uh, regrettably, uh, the recency we have is through July, and what we're starting to see is that the reopening remains but the, the, the illness continues. So I wanted, to, I wanted to tell you, after putting together this particular series, and we've, 
We've tried it also with Apple and Google mobility data that there's a perfect correlation and this is your signpost. You can find organic sickness uh, from the, the coronavirus pandemic uh, eating into, into demand in here, the best data center uh, for energy in the world. The answer is I can't tell you that. As it turns out, even if you look at a national aggregate level, there isn't very much of what you would want of correlation. You can see the lockdowns going from March to April, the black solid line being the VMT decline and the incidence rate as a share of, of population, the dotted line, uh, but then they says they're apart. Now, this being an election year, uh, if we're going to talk about signposts, and this being the night of, I suppose, the US presidential debate, uh, we look at that sort of thing too at Clearview. So uh, very briefly, if we were to look at the states that voted for President Trump in 2016 on a popular basis, you see the same scissoring apart. In fact, uh, the incidence rate of, of, of onset and cases a little bit flatter uh, and the, the contraction in VMT fairly pronounced. If, however, you were to look at the so-called blue states, the ones that voted for Clinton on a popular basis in 2016, you see something that looks much more correlated, much more surprisingly in lockstep. Again, sadly, I wish I could say it was organic and derived from the data, but there's an extenuating multicollinearity, which is that the, these are the states that locked down. So uh, there is a, there's a signpost we're watching, and we're waiting for it. We're looking for organic indicia of disease-driven demand contraction. We're not seeing it. What we are seeing is still the, 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 everything else that you've, you've looked at so far, stringency indices and lockdown incidence rates, also travel restrictions, these are the things that seem to be more or less determinative of demand right now. Uh, and maybe the organic factors will come out in the data later. So with that, uh, I thank you and look forward to coming to discussion. Thank you, John and Kevin. I guess one of the first questions I have is when we think about uh, metrics that uh, people look at in the markets, so we have uh, international tanker rates, we have uh, day rates for, for drilling rigs. Um, those, are, are those reasonable uh, metrics to follow in terms of thinking about the, the market coming into balance um, more so than simply the, the price of Brent or, or various products in whether it's Europe or Asia or the, or the US? Uh, John, do you want to take a crack at that first? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the high frequency data is clearly very important at the moment. I mean, the market is the market is is moving um, both on the on the on particularly on the consumption side. The market is moving much faster than normal. It's moving much faster than the sort of monthly granularity of statistics that we get from the EIA, let alone the lagging statistics that we get from most other from most other countries. So we do need the high frequency data. The difficulty, I think, is often the noisiness of the high frequency data um, and the fact that it's often fairly incomplete. I think the, the, the numbers that I'm looking at, particularly at the moment, are probably um, the aviation data. Uh, clearly, there is a very specific problem at the moment within the within the within the um, within the aviation market, within the jet fuel market, and that's specifically about passenger aviation. So I think that high frequency data is very useful. Um, I'm less convinced at the moment about some of the traffic data. Um, I mean, a lot of people are trying to use these kind of numbers that are being backed out, for example, from TomTom, Tom, and I haven't seen particularly good correlations there. So I think there's a very specific issue um, that we can look at in the in the aviation market. There are some great passenger numbers, um, whether it's from IATA, um, whether it's from um, the aviation regulators and some of the airports. That's quite useful, I think, for tracking the jet market. Other parts of the market much, much harder um, at the moment. But interestingly, the other parts of the market have also normalized much faster. And we've seen, you know, we've seen um, diesel consumption um, outside of the jet area uh, return much faster to something that looks much more near normal. Um, it's the jet area that we really need to keep our eyes on. Okay. Do you have any thoughts, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, John, John is, uh, is exactly where we are. We're looking at the big holes in demand. And so uh, that's why our focus on the IATA data for the RPKs, revenue passenger kilometers. Uh, and uh, we're also thinking about trying to figure out gasoline demand here in the U.S. because it's big. 
uh, the return of, of distillate demand is, is a good, healthy sign. You asked about tankers and rigs. Um, you know, John showed the rig count, and uh, at an absolute level, when you fundamentally pull oil out of the ground, uh, that's the data set you'd work from. Prices can be a bit, uh, a bit distorted, and there's a couple of reasons why. For example, tankers. Uh, tankers can reflect overall economic circumstances, and there's a chance that you're catching something you've already caught, but also sanctions. Uh, we've had instances where there's been distortions in tanker day rates. Uh, some may recall the Costco sanctions last year, uh, which took VLCC prices through the roof uh, at a time when uh, you might not have otherwise expected quite that appreciation. So uh, you have to for some of the distortions. Uh, if you're looking at volumes for something uh, quickly, uh, again, uh, demand, uh, we've had little uh, trying to really make sense of some of the mobility proxies that have been made uh, available, even just trying to backtest them to the Federal Highway Administration's traffic volume change data, which we've been using for years as a pretty good uh, link to gasoline demand. Uh, they don't quite match up. So uh, what do you do at the country, uh, region, or state level? So uh, we're, uh, we're still waiting for that, that magic real-time data set. Uh, and uh, I agree with John, the jet is the problem we're most, most focused on right now. And it, it related to jet, like one of the things that I've read quite a bit about is the impact on cargo that used to be shipped uh, on passenger planes and the kind of a, a, a re kind of a balancing of, of how cargo gets uh, sent uh, on the sh on the kind of high speed route compared to uh, uh, ships is that um, something that that there's good data on uh, that people could look at in terms of of air cargo that's um, kind of rebalancing. Yeah, we have some data on, uh, we do have data on um, total cargo volumes, particularly um, handled at some of the airports, and that includes both cargo that comes in in the belly of a, of a passenger airliner um, and cargo that comes in on a dedicated flight. So we can do that for a lot of the key hubs, and we can do it in, in pretty good close to real time. So we can do that for Heathrow in, 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 in the UK, Frankfurt, Paris, uh, Singapore, Tokyo, we can do, we can do that in with reasonably high frequency. Um, and what we have seen is, you know, actually quite a quite a rapid recovery in 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 air cargo um, movements, and that's part of a actually relatively rapid improvement in global trade. And what I think what we're seeing now is that after the after the initial lockdowns, as the economy has reopened. The merchandise side of the economy, the move, the production and the movement of physical products has actually recovered quite quickly. What is what is what is severely impacted is the services side and particularly anything that involves face to face contact. So it's not just restaurants and bars domestically, it's passenger aviation, it's business travel, it's conferences, it's leisure and tourism. So we're seeing almost like a twin speed recovery, a very rapid recovery on the merchandise side, which is reflected in the international trade volumes. Um, but then, uh, you know, a much more limited recovery on the on the services side, which is passion, which is which is severely impacting passenger aviation. And I guess, John, if you think about diesel versus gasoline uh, prices and kind of the differential between those, like initially we saw a significant reduction in, in gasoline demand and not quite as quick on the diesel side. Does the, if you think about the, I, the um, IMOs, uh, restrictions on, on, phos on sulfur, is that, um, are we able to see any impact of that regulation at this point? Or it's it seems it's almost kind of a non-issue at the, because yeah, I mean I think it 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 would probably have been a non-issue anyway. Um, obviously, the fact that you now have a, a, a you've had a big recession and you've had this huge downturn in jet fuel means a lot more middle distillates that are available and that can be switched into the moon, into the into the shipping fuel market if necessary. So I suspect that the market would never have been as tight as some people feared. Um, but but certainly any prospect of tightness has disappeared with the recession. Great. And we um, are in the process of putting together our October short-term energy outlook and just we're having a discussion about 
uh, Brent versus WTI differentials, one of the, you know, we're kind of in the, the $2 range, you know, recently it had been seeming to run at kind of a $4 differential when you look at the kind of just the components of moving crude from mid-continent to the coast, to loading it, sending it across the ocean. It seems that with the uh, kind of the, the, the stock levels being high at this point and, and you know, coming down in terms of days of supply, that either looking at kind of the OECD days of supply or uh, the price differential between Brent and WTI would kind of represent a rebalancing. Does that make sense? I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot bottled up in the differential sometimes, uh, and it, it often makes sense to compare coastal differentials uh, when you understand the, the inventory picture clearly. Um, so, you know, the price of Brent versus LLS at the coast uh, is generally you're expecting it to be closer uh, and uh, it's not have the inland transportation premium that you bear getting out of Cushing to the coast, for example. Uh, in, uh, in recent months, what we've been doing is looking at the correlation uh, between the Cushing inventories and the, and the WTI Brent differential. It's been pretty tight. Uh, there have been a couple of exceptions. There's actually been more disconnect at the coast uh, with the PAD3 differentials, uh, whether we're talking about WTI Houston uh, or WTI Cushing, uh, or for that matter, LLS, uh, which, which moves weirdly inversely sometimes uh, with, uh, with inventory levels. Um, that, that correlation seems to have been distorted at least a little bit, possibly by the action of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, as a storage site, uh, and uh, also the, the activity of refiners to make such a big difference uh, when they ramp up even a little bit because there's so much refining capacity at the coast. So, uh, you know, the, there's a lot bottled up in that. Uh, not always true that you can decide that there's a normal WTI Brent premium uh, or discount, uh, and geopolitics for the, the Brent price tends to bear the geopolitical risk premia more wholly than the WTI price does as well. So uh, that sometimes can distort things too. John? Thank you, Kelsey. Um, Kevin, with the uh, added export capacity for VLCs, in Corpus Christi that's in the development, did, will that uh, kind of unlock or kind of bring the, those prices closer together, do you think? That, I mean, that's what we're thinking. Um, you know, the, again, the, the individual idiosyncratic distortions are a function of, of not just the things happening out in the world, but the local state of storage. Uh, so how much storage is available in a given location can depress or increase prices too. Right. Um, we've had one question uh, come in here related to prices, and, and the question, and we're going to talk more about this in, in the next panel, but just uh, um, real quickly, in terms of thinking about how OPEC Plus looks at prices, are they, are they focused, do you have a sense, on thresholds in price, um, or are there more physical uh, items that they're focused on? Maybe John? I mean, I think they will always say that they're focused on inventory levels. Um, they will always say that they're focused on normalizing those inventories. I think, you know, in reality, there is a price target, there is a revenue target in the background, um, and that remains implicit, but that, you know, I mean, and I think what you've seen is 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 the the the, the price war where broke out earlier this year when Saudi Arabia and and Russia couldn't agree on what that target should be with the Saudis pushing to try and get prices back up towards something more like seventy dollars a barrel which works for their budget it makes it much easier for them to undertake this ambitious social and economic transformation program, they need the revenues. The Russians, I think, were much more focused on the fact that, that you know, at prices above $60 a barrel, $65 a barrel, they were continuing to lose market share to the United States. And so the Russians were sort of, I think, pushing very much for it to say, look, we need to, we need to be prepared to accept a price 
that is more like $60 a barrel or perhaps below. Um, I think that was the cause of the price war. Uh, you know, I think both sides were a little bit frightened about how far prices dropped. Um, obviously, the price war was launched at a very inopportune time because the pandemic then and the lockdown sort of intensified it. I do think that they'll probably that the target at the moment is probably to try to move oil prices above fifty dollars a barrel. But once Brent price goes above fifty dollars a barrel, I think those divisions between the Russians and the Saudis will re-emerge because I would expect that above fifty dollars a barrel, you'll start to see an acceleration of drilling in the United States, and there will be a discussion within OPEC plus about you know how far they want to try and push the price higher and you know risk losing market share again so i i do think that tension um will re-emerge uh and i do think you know effectively there is a price target although it remains you know they the organization talks in terms of inventory normalization right thank, thank you john and thank you kevin um in order to get the the second panel started here i'm gonna uh, move, move on um, so, with our second panel today, we're focused on supply competition in petroleum and natural gas markets with a focus on longer term issues. So, just as we were talking here a little bit about OPEC Plus, we're thinking uh, and focusing on issues such as OPEC Plus's relationship with Asia, a major uh, area and region of demand growth. Also, uh, potential impacts of recent constrained investment in the upstream sector, uh, both domestically, uh, offshore, and internationally, as well as the impact of, of prices on the growth of global LNG markets in terms of, of developing export facilities, liquefaction facilities, and tankers. For this uh, panel, we're grateful to have three distinguished guests. Our first speaker is Mark Finley, who's a fellow in energy and global oil at Rice University's uh, Baker Institute. Prior to Rice University, Mark was the senior U.S. economist at BP and a man manager at the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. He has held leadership roles in the International Association of Energy Economics, the National Association for Business Economics, and the Conference of Business Economics. Second, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Bekashori, founder and president of SVB International, a strategic energy consulting firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and Dubai. She's widely published and has been a senior energy fellow at the Atlantic Council and the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, among others. Our final speaker is Ross Wayno, who is the lead analyst for America's LNG analytics at S&P Global Platts, where he covers natural gas markets across the Americas. We're very excited to hear their thoughts, so let me hand the speaking over to Mark to get us started. Great. Thanks, John. Um, it's great to be here, and let me add my thanks to the uh, the previous panelists for all the great work and service that you and your colleagues at EIA provide to energy analysts uh, here in the U.S. and all around the world. Um, in my comments, I want to focus specifically on two two key points. I mean, what are OPEC's objectives? And what is the impact of falling at investment? And in particular, I want to talk about shale, and I'm going to bring the two back together at the very end. Um, so first, to OPEC. Um, you know, and we've started this conversation already with John and Kevin. Um, you can't talk about the oil market without it. Um, I think it's important to set a bit of context. And by the way, you mentioned that you wanted to have a longer-term focus, but I'm going to mix long and short term in my commentary because you really can't get to the long term until you get through the short term. Um, so it's important for a starting point to know where we are. I mean, OPEC and the plus countries, including Russia, have engaged in the largest coordinated oil production cuts ever. You know, began in the springtime with a mammoth almost 10 million barrels a day of production cuts. Now it is moderated to only about 8 million barrels a day uh, of, of coordinated production cuts among the OPEC and plus countries. And moreover, we've seen very strong compliance, um, which is something that has not been part of the typical pattern for uh, coordinated production cuts in the past. Um, and as uh, John and Kevin noted, these coordinated mammoth production cuts have succeeded in turning the world oil market from a surplus into a deficit, even with the biggest demand decline that we've ever seen. 
Um, and what's different here is not just the size of the cuts, but the methods. You know, after the price war, uh, we saw aggressive enforcement of, of production targets, led in particular by the Saudis and the Russians. Uh, we even had the Saudis and their GCC allies underproducing relative to their production targets for several months. And moreover, we've seen the uh, agreement on an unprecedented payback mechanism uh, for countries that had previously exceeded their production targets to have to pay back that excess production uh, over the next few months. So this is clearly not the old OPEC. Back then, cheaters cheated and the core members kind of quietly lobbied behind the scenes. Now, we're seeing very public, very assertive, um, you know, and strong interventions from the very top with people like the Saudi Crown Prince reaching out directly to leaders in places like Iraq and Nigeria uh, to reach these agreements. So what does OPEC and OPEC Plus want? Yeah, you know, I think John and Kevin were exactly right. First and foremost, they need to rebalance the market in the face of the COVID pandemic, and they've succeeded. Prices are back around 40 bucks, even though global demand remains well below where it was pre-pandemic. Is that all? Well, we're not out of the woods yet. You know, the demand path remains a question, I think, you know, as the risk of a second wave or maybe even a third wave here in the United States, you know, as we head into the winter, you know, the virus remains in the driver's seat. You know, so for now, I think, you know, in terms of what does the group want, I think the main question is, can they maintain discipline and will the cuts, which are scheduled to moderate by a further 1 million barrels a day at year end, will they be enough? Um, and as uh, John noted, we're already seeing some disagreement around the tactics. You know, early on, the Saudis wanted to extend those original 10 million barrels a day of cuts. The Russians were worried about over-tightening and uh, losing market share, especially to shale producers. I'll come back to that. Just this week, uh, Russia's Rosneft uh, officials were warning IOCs like BP and Shell, you know, against shifting investment too quickly away from oil in the face of the energy transition for fear of setting in motion the next price spike. Longer term, I think we're going to see these same tensions playing out. You know, short-term revenue needs for states that are still dependent on petrodollars, um, even as we see efforts to diversify economies and sources of revenue, uh, broadening tax bases, uh, programs like the Saudi Vision 2030. Longer term, it's all about climate. You know, the threat to future oil and natural gas demand and prices, you know, and that could lead to pressures um, and efforts to increase market share and monetize the resources of these large, conventional, low-cost producers. But questions also about how aggressively to engage in this international discussion and to what end. Uh, you know, to delay, uh, to push for uh, carbon capture like the Saudi participation OGCI, uh, moving to, you know, defend oil and gas as part of a transition. For example, um, you know, yesterday's announcement of uh, Aramco sending some blue ammonia to Japan for the first time with carbon capture. I personally subject, su suspect that what we'll see is volatility in tactics as the key players try to juggle their short-term revenue needs and these longer-term strategic objectives. Let me move next to the lower investment and the impact of it, and we're already seeing it, especially here in the United States, but as Kevin pointed out, coming soon you know, to oil producers all around the world. Yeah, we've already seen massive shut-ins of existing supply when prices collapsed in the spring, when prices fell below the operating cost of the individual wells. Almost all of that has actually come back online, uh, but now we're seeing the main event, which is the impact of investment. Here in the U.S., we've seen the collapse of the rig count, as John pointed out, um, and we've seen dramatically reduced plans for spending going forward. And that's not just a matter of the pandemic and lower prices. You know, we've seen, um, you know, a lot of talk about peak demand uh, and the, the, the risk thereof with growing climate pressure and ESG pressures on companies. There's also just the simple matter that the oil and gas sector is falling out of favor with investors, um, you know, on the back of decades of poor returns. You know, this is especially true uh, for shale producers um, who are having trouble accessing capital markets right now, but I'd say it's an issue for the industry more broadly. For now, as John noted, the rig count looks to have bottomed out, but this is not the last cycle. You know, last time we had a price collapse, the U.S. shale industry shocked the world by, you know, remaining competitive. And they did that by realizing massive productivity gains 
you know, with per wet rig productivity doubling and tripling, you know, in the main shale plays. And by the way, kudos to EIA for the great work that you all do on the drilling productivity report, which is the basis of my research anyway in this vein. Um, the industry also had significant cost cutting back then. And on the back of that, we saw the United States able to, on the bottom of the price cycle and on the upside in 2017 and 18, achieve dramatic, in fact, all-time record growth of production. The biggest growth of any country in the world in one year happened in the United States in 2018. And it was prices much below their pre, you know, pre, uh, price collapse peaks. Um, again, you know, this shocked the competition, especially uh, OPEC members and Russia drove prices lower. But now, you know, can we expect the same efforts to maintain competitiveness? Well, you can expect the same efforts, but you're not going to expect the same results. Um, you know, productivity growth has slowed dramatically as the technology has matured just like you would expect it to. Um, you know, there is limited co scope for cost cutting, um, you know, but not to the same degree that we've seen before, because frankly, the industry was already in cost cutting mode heading into the pandemic. Um, and that's even before we get to the investor pressures mentioned, you know, earlier. And the, you know, and the 800 pound gorilla in the conversation now is decline rates. Yeah, with the growth of shale production and the rapid, you know, decline of individual wells, you know, you know it certainly looks to me like, um, we are nowhere near the levels of investment and activity needed to even stabilize production, let alone think about growing it. By the way, there's one big uncertainty in here, and that is the potential disconnect between drilling and completions. You know, the famous drilled and uncompleted wells or ducks. Um, EIA's data doesn't show a huge drop in that, but some other analysts actually think that there has been a greater drawdown in the, you know, this inventory of, un, you know, drilled but uncompleted wells, which could help to support production going forward. Um, there's also a fear that EIA carries a lot of um, non, you know, wells in its inventory that aren't realistically ever likely to see production, the so-called dead ducks. So here's my suggestion. I think this is a great time for EIA to scrub its duck data uh, and to reassess its collection methodology. I mean, but again, for me, the bottom line right now is that we're nowhere near the levels of investment activity needed to stabilize production. And let me bring the OPEC and investment together in my final thought, which is this. What if OPEC plus and Russia, we hear, is already concerned about this? What if they base their market engagement going forward on a fear of massive U.S. supply response that fails to materialize? You know, what if the U.S. isn't able to deliver the strong growth you know, at prices that we have come to expect, then what? Let me stop there. And I'll look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, John, for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, here today. Um, so there has been already many uh, issues discussed uh, by uh, other panelists uh, and uh, previous panels, especially about the numbers and market, uh, market trajectory. Uh, I'd like to uh, categorize my um, remarks today into both supply and demand. So as was mentioned uh, on the demand side, uh, the major concern is the demand recovery for jet fuel. People are traveling less, uh, obviously, by air. And the demand recovery that market, uh, oil demand recovery that market uh, witnessed uh, in the past few months was very unbalanced in terms of different types of fuel. And uh, we have seen things that we might not uh, ever expected uh, to see, like uh, the jet fuel, which uh, traditionally was uh, higher prices uh, because uh, of the process is required to be produced uh, a lighter distillate. Now the prices have uh, reduced uh, significantly that the straight line kerosene, which is usually used to uh, use into jet fuel now being used uh, to make a very low sulfur uh, fuel oil for maritime industry. Also in the process of preventing to uh, reducing the jet fuel uh, yield on the other side, uh, put pressure on expansion and increased uh, yield of diesel, which uh, we could see the result of that on inventories, that how quickly the diesel uh, inventories uh, increased as well. So uh, jet fuel recovery is uh, still remains a big question. And uh, among the refineries that in the downstream sectors, those refineries, especially particularly in U.S., that we were discussing with them since the beginning, their main headache was how could they uh, 
balance these uh, yields of these refineries, especially as we hit the summertime, which uh, driving season increased, the, uh, the quarantine uh, have been reduced on different states uh, in the United States and people started traveling by car. And this year, especially the driving season, uh, the demand for gasoline and driving was much higher uh, than previous years because people uh, in, in a ratio because people were uh, taking less flights. So producing more gasoline but less uh, jet fuel uh, put a toll on the diesel yields. Uh, and now we're seeing that how the straight run kerosene is being used for um, uh, using as a fuel oil uh, to be used in a, in a maritime uh, industry. So. Uh, the challenge for the refinery sector, uh, sector particularly, uh, was uh, very uh, concerning uh, to adjust their yields. And in different markets, like for instance, India, India have reduced its refinery yields, but it's importing gasoline. So we have seen some uh, changes in the flow of uh, uh, fuel uh, and trade, even uh, not only in the domestic. Uh, uh, consumption and uh, supply of uh, gasoline and different fuels, but also the export uh, trends and trade. Um, on the gas demand, uh, however, the story uh, is different because the gas demand was already uh, suffering before the COVID uh, hit the market, and only the situation was uh, exacerbated. Uh, the COVID only uh, intensified the uh, imbalanced market uh, because, because of significantly uh, the uh, lower demand growth in Asia, which was absorbing most of the uh, chunk of the LNG that was coming into the market uh, in the past uh, five years, four, four and a half, five years, which mostly coming from, uh, was coming from U.S. Also, uh, in Europe, uh, industrial countries like Germany, their demand was not growing as it used to grow. So the imbalanced market uh, in for the LNG and natural gas was uh, or, uh, different, but I will go back uh, to LNG, uh, how the supply uh, demand in uh, LNG recovered. So the demand recovery that we expected uh, was that we're going to have a V-shape uh, for um, gasoline, a W-shaped recovery for diesel, but more of an L-shaped recovery for jet fuel. On the supply side, so since the uh, beginning of the uh, April, at the time that uh, the quarantine and COVID become a global uh, issue and most of the countries, including the United States, is starting to announce in the quarantines, there has been so many uncertainty with regard to the uh, demand uh, destruction. And obviously, the numbers keep changing, expectations keep changing. So from the beginning, we tried to have a close conversation both with the uh, U.S. producers and OPEC uh, producing countries. On the U.S. producing countries, most of the EMP companies immediately started to react uh, to the low oil prices by cutting their capital uh, investment. So um, some of the major ENT companies, they have already learned a lesson from the previous price uh, crash and they had built a resiliency and flexibility within their uh, balance sheet and they created a diverse uh, portfolio inside, uh, both inside of US in terms of their assets and outside of US. But obviously case by case, they had different situations. The, the major takeaway that we had through our discussions with U.S. EMP companies were that they all have seen or uh, seen the low oil prices as a new normal, and their business model and strategy has been changed for tackling for a long-term low oil price environment. Therefore, the, the key uh, strategy, the key strategy under the long-term low oil prices scenario has been to focus on their best assets. Uh, that could raise revenue and cash flow for them under any circumstances. And if I would want to go like a bullet point on what is their business model under this new uh, norm of low oil prices, I would say that they all unanimously mentioned that their strategy is overlooking to protecting their balance sheet, increasing their cash flow, and meeting their dividend commitments to their shareholders. Now here, based on this business model, we raised the question to them that would they see at some point potentially uh, to uh, cooperate, uh, they would cooperate with, uh, with the OPEC. Uh, uh, these discussions were happening before the historical deal that 
uh, OPEC Plus have reached. Uh, and we just wanted to see that what is the reaction of U.S. EMP companies, given the situation that OPEC uh, plus uh, are cutting their uh, production, has been cutting their production in the past few years just to, uh, uh, we could say, like subsidize the huge or give away some market share to the huge uh, shale growth. Um, would, we just wanted to see, the entertain the, see if they are entertaining the idea of under, uh, under some uh, situation and environment of emergency such as COVID, would, be, would they be ready to uh, cooperate with the U.S., uh, with the OPEC plus? Unanimous answer was no. Their only commitment of EMP companies is obviously to their uh, shareholders, and they would not want to commit to a situation that they would have to commit to a production cut at the time that they could uh, raise their price, uh, ra raise their production. So the answer was no. And as we seen, uh, as we saw later, the OPEC plus. Um, agreement came uh, along with a U.S. Uh, obviously U.S. Uh, uh, also U.S. government. I would say on a federal government, despite the fact that U.S. federal government cannot have a direct say to the producers, there was this communication between the OPEC Plus and U.S. Uh, government uh, with regard to the production cost. But most of the commitment, or I would say, like the numbers that U.S. put on the table, was the organic cut of U.S. Uh, of the uh, U.S. EMP uh, producers. On the OPEC Plus side, uh, there has been some changes. Uh, Mark already mentioned to a major one that is uh, the most important, significant one is the change of methodology. But few changes happened uh, before, right before and after COVID. One is uh, the uh, change of uh, Saudi uh, oil minister. Uh, Prince Abdul Aziz have a very different approach uh, in compared to the previous uh, Saudi minister. Uh, he started his first uh, introductory remark as a Saudi minister, uh, uh, promoting the idea of inclusiveness. Uh, we all know that it's really Saudi Arabia, Russia, and uh, in communication with U.S. when the OPEC plus comes to major agreements. Well, of course, UAE also, Kuwait have important uh, Roles, but uh, it's very something that is very fascinating, and we start noticing is that Prince Abdulaziz, uh, Russia, and also OPEC in general, not only they are communicating with the physical market, but also with the paper market in their remarks. They are very sensitive, and they are very concerned about their statements and its impact on the mind of algorithm. So the way that Prince Abdulaziz, Russian um, uh, oil minister, and OPEC statements right after the meetings or during during the meetings, uh, they are all engineered to have the uh, maximize, I would say, positive in terms of uh, OPEC gold impact on the mind of algorithm. For instance, in the past month that the OPEC Plus decided, I, I mean, based on their program, uh, planned program, uh, or schedule, uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia particularly were going to increase uh, their uh, cut uh, for about each 100, uh, 500,000 barrels. They made sure that they're communicating to the market that this uh, additional 500,000 barrels, each coming from each country, is going to be used domestically. Well, we know that it's going to ultimately have an impact on the global uh, supply, but they are very careful that uh, the statement and the procedure that OPEC reaches to decisions not only impact on a physical market, but also the mind of the traders and most uh, significantly the mind of algorithm, which is taking the key, uh, key uh, keywords uh, in its uh, price uh, calculation. The other uh, uh, important uh, uh, change that OPEC Plus take in the factor was that this time OPEC Plus came with a longer uh, term after uh, their historical uh, agreement. Uh, they came uh, into a, they, they introduced to a market a long term period of cut schedule. Well, obviously they are meeting on a regular basis, but what is significant is that they want to create a certainty for market and most significantly for investors to have an idea that, for instance, each month or each period, how OPEC Plus is going to uh, react in terms of their cut uh, 
schedule, which gives some sort of uh, predictability to the market. This is something that was not exist before. Uh, and uh, OPEC has now uh, tried to not only give uh, assurance to market for the next month production or the next cycle or uh, until their uh, next meeting, but also a longer uh, period of time of assurance and predictability for uh, investors, both in the uh, physical market and uh, um, paper market. Uh, uh, Sarah, quickly, and, yes. If, if I can, uh, um, let's switch over to Ross. Um, sure. And so we can make sure everyone has some time and some time for questions and answers. That was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Ross, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Yep. And there's my slides. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ross Wayno. I'm a lead analyst here at uh, S&P Global Pat Plats covering America's LNG. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll switch gears a little bit and focus really in on the global gas and LNG markets. Uh, if we could switch the slide. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, global gas and LNG prices were really on the decline even prior to the global LNG pandemic and or the global uh, pandemic. And that is because there was the confluence of both uh, a series of warmer than normal winters, which led to storage builds in both Northeast Asia and Northwestern Europe, but also a massive expansion in the supply base that was really led by uh, the United States and to a lesser degree uh, Russia and Australia. And this uh, combination of falling demand, which was partially weather related, and uh, rising supply really pressured markets before we even got into 2020. But as we can see, by the time the WHO had declared a global pandemic, uh, global gas and LNG prices really moved to unfounded or uh, historically low levels. Um, and we saw the uh, front month contract price for the Dutch TTF, which is uh, the uh, the Northwestern European uh, uh, sort of benchmark hub price, fall below the outright uh, prompt price for the US Henry hub. This was really um, an unprecedented event. And the JKM, which is a Platts assessed spot price for LNG in Northeast Asia, uh, on a monthly average traded within cents of the U.S. Henry Hub, and actually on a daily basis, we saw that outright price drop below the Henry Hub as well. Even potentially more surprising is we saw this oil index price, which had always really uh, been a premium price across uh, the global markets, um, which we assessed at roughly 14.85% the price of crude oil. It also saw a major collapse uh, in the beginning of 2020 as oil prices came down and because LNG is priced on a usually two to three month lag where you're now just seeing the effects of that oil price collapse really play into the energy markets. Um, Kelsey, if you go to the next slide, please. So what did that cause? Um, you know, from a U.S. perspective, uh, we like to look at these prices in terms of the net back. And that is just essentially your destination market price minus the variable costs of supply and your variable costs of transportation. And so these can vary throughout the year depending on how much shipping is, uh, the day rate for shipping is going, how much uh, it costs for regasification capacity and how much your underlying feedstock gas price is. And you can see that uh, during most of the last five years, we've seen positive netbacks, which have allowed for these LNG export facilities in the U.S. to dispatch their LNG cargos at or even above contract levels. So somewhere between 85 to 100 percent of capacity is being dispatched through the most of the last five years. But as we get into 2019, we can see that these netbacks uh, start collapsing along with the falling global uh, LNG and gas prices. And by the time we get into early 2020, uh, with the announcement of the global pandemic, we can see that these netbacks then start to trend into negative territory. This means that exporters from the U.S., which are exposed to, to a number of these variable costs, uh, including shipping and regasification, are no longer able to rationalize their exports uh, from an economic perspective. And what we saw was a massive reduction in U.S. LNG feed gas deliveries to the terminals and therefore a massive reduction in U.S. LNG exports. Now, 
this is really an unprecedented reduction in LNG supplies that we've never seen before from any single country uh, outside of major maintenances. And it actually, I think, you know, on one hand can be seen as a major risk of the market in the sense that we might now see uh, very low returns to some of these LNG export projects from some of these exporters, but I think it will also be seen in another way. The dynamism that U.S. LNG production is adding to the market is creating a much more liquid, much more dynamic market that is able to balance during periods of severe crisis, such as the global pandemic and the demand destruction that resulted from it. Um, the large amount of the, con the cargoes that were pulled from the market were in fact pulled from spot sales uh, and reflected and, and created uh, a subsequent uh, pressure on the uh, relevant forward curves for both the Platts JKM and for the Northwestern European TTF and allowed prices to rationalize. So it is certainly a volatile time and a time where many of the major LNG uh, exporters and many prestigious uh, energy firms will be bruised, um, but it is also reflecting the true dynamism that has formed within the LNG markets over a short period of time, largely on the back of new North American gas supplies. And just turning to the last slide, I just sort of like to sum up with the point that we've seen a massive expansion in U.S. LNG export capacity over the last five years, a large majority of which has just come online this year, and most of which has not yet run at full capacity because we've been in the middle of the pandemic and these uh, unprecedented cargo cancellations and underutilizations in the summer of 2020. But once these facilities come back online and are able to operate toward near full capacity, which we expect to see by mid-winter 2021, and with the addition of several more trains through 2022, we think that the U.S. will rise to become the world's largest LNG exporter by 2022, even surpassing Australia and Qatar. I think maybe even more interestingly, once we add on facilities such as Calcasieu Pass, Golden Pass, and LNG Canada, which are all financed and currently under construction, which we consider as the second wave of North American LNG export capacity expansions. We think total North American export capacity will reach 16 BCF per day and maintain North America's dominance of global LNG exports at that time. So our participation in the global market is nearly assured at this point based on uh, financing and construction that is already underway, and that our interconnectedness into the global gas and LNG markets will only further grow over the next five to 10 years. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to John and potentially take questions if we have time for them. Great. I, um, I know we have quite a few hundred people still on the line here, so we'll, we'll spend a, uh, five, 10 minutes uh, taking questions. One of the first questions for Sarah in terms of thinking about what Ross just uh, talked about here, in terms of North America becoming a major uh, LNG exporter, how do you think the developing countries like India, China, uh, even Indonesia, and others in Asia uh, view the, kind of the opportunities to use gas from the Americas versus using uh, oil from the Middle East and Russia? Well, to answer this, there are different factors. One is the uh, energy transition. Most of these countries are looking into using more gas uh, than oil if we compare it with oil. But in terms of LNG, if we want to, uh, uh, Ross already talked about U.S. Uh, huge capacity that has been grown and U.S. is going to turn in the largest uh, producer very uh, soon. One thing that U.S. is offering uniquely is that most of this LNG capacity, which is currently today about 15 percent of global LNG capacity, is homeless LNG. It's, a, uh, it's offered to the highest bid and goes where it's needed. So it's a very close to a commodity trade. And after the COVID that many contracts have been canceled, what we observe is, is that many countries that are receiving LNG are more interested in signing more flexible contracts uh, or uh, receiving uh, like spot LNG the way that US uh, offers. So ultimately, 
despite the rate that it's in the market, U.S. is going to have a very important role in the LNG market uh, today. Uh, I mean, in the first few months that there was lots of cancellation of cargoes in U.S., obviously because U.S. LNG was homeless LNG, U.S. production of gas reached very close to domestic use. So, um, which means there's ultimately no capacity for export or very little capacity for export. Now that we are getting closer to the winter, uh, at some point, uh, Indian Energy Minister was um, not accepting any offer for LNG, but the prices have been increased significantly in the past uh, month uh, and weeks that uh, market is reaching to the winter, uh, the gas uh, demand is increasing, and uh, U.S. Uh, recount uh, uh, reduced significantly and uh, production reduced. So, at some point, U.S., uh, even though that might have to compete in this race, but if U.S. LNG is not there, there's going to be a huge uh, impact on the market. Uh, something that is very important is geopolitical factor, obviously. What we have observed is that the U.S.-China trade uh, conflict or rivalry uh, have caused a major changes in China's energy security policy, which is going to have impact on amount of imports that they were previously planned to have from U.S. Because of the conflict, conflicts and hurdles that they had in the past few years, they are relying more on other sources, including their own domestic coal or uh, their own domestic gas. So they are investing a lot on their own domestic resources. They are reviving some of those coal uh, sources that they previously thought that they're going to put aside. But also they are looking into in additional supplies from different countries, particularly from Russia, uh, importing gas from Russia. So uh, the China-US trade relation had impact on the Chinese long-term strategy, but still we cannot say China could meet its all of the growing demand, even though that its demand has been slowed down without uh, U.S. Uh, supplies. Thank you. And for Mark, building off of what Sarah just said, how, how should U.S. gas producers uh, plan in this environment where the U.S. is being seen as a, uh, a marginal supplier that can respond as needed? Are, are they should they be planning for bigger swings in prices? Great question. And if I, you know anybody who can actually predict prices, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, look, I, I think um, uh, it's, um, you know, as, 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 as both, both um, you know, the other panelists noted that, you know, the U.S. is transitioned from being largely a domestic natural gas market to being more connected to a global one. Um, you know, people in the past used to ask me, well, should there be a gas uh, cartel? And on the international stage, I would answer, well, there already is one because it's OPEC because a lot of the gas contracts were, the LNG contracts at least, were indexed to oil prices. Uh, but that is breaking down largely because of this flexible uh, market-based pricing uh, that the U.S. producers are bringing into the market. I think one of the really interesting questions going forward is, um, you know, what we've seen in recent years is that, um, you know, get, you know, given you know, the large disconnect between oil and natural gas prices um, here in the United States, um, which historically was not the case, um, the, the, that large disconnect meant that a lot of the economics of natural gas production growth in the United States was actually driven by the associated liquids and higher oil prices. Um, and, you know, with, with the changes we've seen and discussed in the oil market, um, if the associated liquids aren't going to carry the burden, you know, what I think, you know, one, one thing we're going to have to pay closer attention to is the pure gas economics and the competitiveness thereof, you know, maybe without the potential uplift from the, you know, the liquid side of it. And a question for Ross, thinking about Canada and Mozambique LNG uh, opportunities, I guess, are the current gas prices that people we're seeing is that you know limiting the ability for those areas to develop and become major players in the market yeah well i mean they're they're two very different markets to be to be fair um but they're obviously both affected by low prices and i would say that you know aside from their own internal economics which i think 
can you we we could go down quite a rabbit hole talking about both of those countries. I think more broadly speaking, we can say that the lower gas prices and specifically the the, the more recent experience from many of the U.S. LNG export projects will likely limit the amount of further investment we see in the U.S. Gulf Coast or really the U.S. overall, um, simply because this uh, flexible style of oil index uh, financing or uh, of gas hub index financing, um, which puts a lot of the price risk onto the exporters themselves, um, has not panned out uh, that great for, for many of these exporters that have not had a, um, a home market to take these LNG cargos. So your international oil companies and your LNG marketing firms that are sitting on sp basically spot exposed LNG are largely taking a hit on that liquefaction fee. And I think they'll be reticent to sign up any additional capacity. That means that what you need to build a, a, an expansion um, is fundamental buyers with fundamental demand. So these are uh, largely going to be um, Asian utilities, which feature in our forecasts uh, the great, greatest prospects for uh, LNG and natural gas demand growth, um, or potentially some uh, additional buyers, uh, some new buyers across Europe. So, because you have this uh, this experience, this, this recent experience in North America, which you know I think will be rectified through secondary contracting of some of this spot exposed capacity, I think what you'll see is a limitation of new competition really coming from North American suppliers, which could open up the field again uh, for a, a Mozambique or potentially expansions from Canada. But I would say that because of the distance to market and because of the types of resources that are available, it seems that at this point, Mozambique might be more advantageous than uh, additional projects in Canada. Mm -hmm. There have been a couple of questions about the environmental role uh, in terms of reducing emissions by using gas in, in the global market, as well as uh, questions related to uh, alternative ways. So instead of blue hydrogen, thinking about green hydrogen from solar and wind, uh, would any of you have any thoughts on, uh, in terms of the industry perspective, on the speed at which, uh, quote unquote, green hydrogen is is coming into the market to compete with LNG? Maybe Ross, you want to go first? Or... Yeah, yeah, well, I can, I can stop, take a stab at that really quickly. I mean, I think that there, there that is certainly one of the longer term risks uh, to, I would say, uh, global LNG demand growth uh, is a supplanting that. Uh, type of uh, uh, that type of fuel source with a with a gr with a clearly greener product. I think the big question comes is uh, you know a will it become economic uh, in time to to really uh, to to really make a big impact on the market. But also, if you are uh, having this revolution in green technology that allows for the creation of green hydrogen, well, why wouldn't you also have the ability to to just create that that power locally? using your own uh, local renewable power resources. Um, so I think that there is a possibility. I think that there's also um, a possibility of, of, of some small growth in the blue hydrogen markets as well. Um, but the time horizon at which those are going to become, I think, uh, economic and available for the, the broader industry is likely a, a time when we're going to see a massive global shift in the way that we use power and consume power. Um, and in that point, it, it becomes a real big question is if if it will have advanced uh, far enough and fast enough at that point. And the only thing I would add is that gas has no chance of competing in a climate constraint scenario without, you know, uh, significant uh, improvement in reduce and, and manage flaring and fugitive emissions. Yeah. And, and I know there's a lot of great work going along going on on that front, but yeah, that's that's a huge issue for the gas industry to master to, to even have a chance of competing in the climate or the, you know, the energy transition. Right. Well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, we've had a, a great discussion here, and uh, there's no clapping <laughs> that can happen on these webinars, but uh, thank you to John and Kevin, uh, Mark, Sarah, and Ross. Uh, I want to uh, remind everyone that uh, there is another workshop, or third work workshop, is coming up on Thursday of this week, uh, focused on electric power markets. And I'm sure uh, some of the questions that were submitted here uh, will 
be addressed in that uh, workshop uh, in terms of the interaction between especially natural gas and uh, the power market. Uh, and if you have follow-up questions, we encourage people to submit questions to annual energy outlook at eia.gov. That's here on the screen here. Uh, and as I said before, uh, we will uh, post uh, a recording uh, with closed captioning of this uh, uh, workshop and the slides uh, on our website. And our annual energy outlook uh, 2021 is slated to be released in the late January, early February timeframe. So with that, thank you everyone and have a good day.